I would like to begin by actually saying that uh, 50 years definitely is a time for us to introspect, for us to re-examine what we have done before. What are the lessons to be learned? What are our strengths and what are our weaknesses? And I think all the uh, speakers before me have done so. But I, I get a bit concerned and worried listening to all the, uh, the speeches and our interactions. Some say uh, ASEAN is not a supranational, is not perfect. And uh, I think uh, my friends, some, some of them say that it is all right. What's wrong in being a toothless tiger? I think at this age also, I'm, I've got some of my teeth gone. <laughs> so the, uh, I think it is important that uh, we accept the fact that even if we are toothless, or we take step by step way that we hope that in the process of 50 years, we have actually matured and we do not become senile. I think I'm worried if we become senile because we take for granted that since we are old, everybody will have to consult. And I think it would be a bit uh, ridiculous if you were to say that after 50 years, we still consider what if there is no ASEAN? I think that question is out of the question. There is no way that we can opt out of ASEAN. We are here to stay. But I think, how do we improve our house? How do we improve our structure? That is what I think we are here for in the next. I wish anyway, when they ask me to, what's next? You know, as the last speakers with Mati, I said, good God. You know, I would like to have now a crystal ball. I could forecast the future. You know, ASEAN is funny because we have, uh, just now when we were discussing about centrality, my understanding when we attended the ASEAN centrality, at the first meeting I attended as a foreign minister, we were talking about the possibility, since we are involved with all the major powers, that we must rotate the chairmanship of the ARF, that we should give all the dialogue partners with the dialogue partners. It should be rotated. This, uh, this meeting was in Singapore. And uh, then we said, it cannot be. How can we rotate? Because we have to play the central role. You see, that was, I understand the central role as a foreign minister as meaning that we are willing to take leadership. Just not to be told what is, what we need to do or the agenda that we need to take. So it's, it's important for us I think to accept that this before, during my time, you see, I always get nostalgic, you know. We used, to, the big powers or the major powers used to be frustrated with us by the step-by-step -step move or the comfort level. I think I remember when India could not get to one of our, you know, India used to have, uh, because we have got the annual dinner, and all of them have to put up their show. The Russians will come with all the big shows. The American also will come with, you know, each one of them competing at that level. It's all right. It's not a geopolitical competition. It was all right for us. So they get frustrated with us because we are so sticky with principles. I, I remember when we were talking about East Asia, you see, the, the geographical footnote is important. The first time that we make a change, that the big powers influence us, but we don't like to admit anyway, was when we formed the EAS, because I was there. It was formed in Kuala Lumpur, 2003 meeting. 
So we included New Zealand, we included India, we included Australia. Then, when we were asked the question, we say the most important thing is geopolitical consideration. It's not just the geographical footnote. You don't want to have the geographical foot, free not footnote, whatever it is. And the Russians say, if you talk about the East, they also have got the East. Why are we excluded? The reason they are excluded is because at that time, U.S. finds it, they, we cannot, at the initial stage of EAS, include Russia without including all the other major powers like the So, I mean, we evolve. We are an organization that evolves. We never do things in a rush. So nowadays, I think, anyway, today, instead of the, of the big powers getting frustrated, with us because we are either slow or we are evolving or we refuse to say anything. Now I can say with more freedom. <laughs> so, you know, now even the members are frustrated. You see, there is a shift. There is a global paradigm shift of global power. ASEAN is still there. We see that we have been successful on the economic integration. We have declared 2015 an ASEAN community. I always ask myself, you know, when you want to call yourself a community, then there is a need for you to define what a community is. You know, we are not so sure about the community. Because if it is a community, then we cannot be oversensitive or insensitive to the feeling of the others. We must learn to understand the feeling of others. You know, I don't believe that tolerance is the key word in ASEAN relationship or association. It cannot be because tolerance means I don't like you, but I tolerate you. That's not enough. We are nations of 625 million we always quote GDP sometime. There are people who say that we should be given a Nobel Prize. I'm a bit worried about Nobel Prize. Because <laughs> Nobel, Nobel Prize, a Nobel Laureate, has got a big responsibility. It's just not an accolade for you to accept. But there is a responsibility. I remember the strength of ASEAN before. Myanmar was a problem. When my time, I always get, I think, negative comments from our big boys, the major powers. Why must Malaysia, and they call Malaysia with all kinds of names, because I was at the foreign minister at the time, that Malaysia was in the center of many controversies. So, but we always say that Myanmar is part of Southeast Asia. Our founding fathers wanted the five, the core founding members were five. But we always vision, our vision was to have the whole of ASEAN, South Asian nations, to be part of us. So that was, that was our intention, and now 10. So when Myanmar came with all the, I think, weaknesses and shortcomings in every meeting, we get a lecture from our European friends how uh, ASEAN is not a proper organization by inviting a, a horrible regime, according to them. But we say, no, they are part of us. It's only through constructive engagement that we can bring countries together, have a common position. And we face a lot of problems with Myanmar in every meeting. They don't want to put the flag of Myanmar. They don't want Myanmar to attend a meeting on ASEAN. But what did ASEAN do? ASEAN stick together and protected Myanmar. We stick together because we know centrality means togetherness. If we are no longer central, then we will be the things that we did not want to be. That is 
we do not want to be a theater of big power rivalry. The ASEAN way is respect, understanding the other. Now, I, I myself believe that in, we, in us talking about introspection, it is important. I'm going to finish because 15 minutes no, is about to be time. over. Don't, don't worry about it. <laughs> I'm, I think when we talk about introspection, we need to revisit some of the issues. ASEAN, if we look at our population composition, is mostly young. Over 60% of ASEAN are young population. What future have we promised for them? What type, I think my friend from Dr. Narungat, Narung Chai just now mentioned about work permits and all these things. And then our education, infrastructure. What have we done? And Singapore and Thailand, I think, is a, an old population, aging population. So they need to move and they need to work in other countries. So I think it is important in this particular case for us to be able to look at some core values. I think our problem is we do not hold some of the universal core values. That's our problem. What about democracy? Ah, okay, my friends say that he doesn't want to use democracy because maybe there is an absence of democracy in ASEAN countries. So I, I mentioned during lunch just now, okay, we don't call ourselves democracy because our democracy is defined as not freedom, not human rights, but we define development as the most important thing. That's how I find so what do we do? I think we have got a participative representation of the people. And the people now would like us to see at some of the issues. When the whole international population is looking at some of the issues, if we refuse to look at it and say we want to minimize problems, we do not want to upset the others, I don't know, after 50 years, I think, we should be truthful and sincere enough to recognize there is a problem, we sit down together. I remember before, I'm not criticizing the present. Eh? Please, when I talk about before, don't think that I'm criticizing the present. What I'm saying is before, when the leaders meet, things get difficult. They say, let the foreign ministers meet. And when the officials, the saw meetings, they cannot resolve problems, they refer it to the foreign minister. <laughs> so it's a very, you know, it's a complementary. There is always various stages that we go, we go through. So, but I think now there is a problem. Let us address those problems. You know, non-traditional and security matters, I always consider since we were formed in 1967, 8th of August, security matters, whether traditional or non-traditional, is actually part of the ASEAN agenda. Why I, do I say that? Because security matters involve social, economic, political, and cultural. So it has to be part of our agenda. So I, I remember, I think before I close, I remember one meeting where we had with the ASEM or summit, where one of the European representatives, he was a dep deputy prime minister from uh, Luxembourg. He came to the meeting in Jakarta. So we sat down together. He was giving us a lecture on Myanmar. Like I think uh, uh, Maudlin Albright used to do during our ARF meeting. I said, don't believe in this, in this sweet talk and smile. What we defended our colleagues, our brothers in ASEAN. So when the, he said, I took up an issue on democracy. None of you ASEAN foreign ministers support me, no talk about it. You know, in Europe, EU, if we have got a problem, we speak openly and we criticize. I said, then you have to learn the courtesy of ASEAN. You know, it doesn't mean that we agree with everything that our fellow members but we are very polite. Uh, 
So we are very polite. How are we polite? I said, we bring to our colleague, to our fellow ASEAN members, in meetings where there is no noise. Quiet diplomacy. We try to convince and persuade our fellow ASEAN members to follow <coughs> the way that is acceptable to the regional interests and to the international interests. I think finally, I just would like to mention, it's about time that we stop thinking in terms of national interest, in terms of nationalism, in terms of what is popular. We need to shape. That's what leadership is all about. Otherwise, we will become followers. And ASEAN with 625 million and such a strength in, in its economic position should not just be a follower. We should make a difference to the world. And I think we can do that by now developing our collective interests, regional interests, then only, I think, it will make meaning to a community or even, I think, we are hypocritical if we talk about people-centered ASEAN if we do not involve the population, we are still institutional-centered, we do not involve the civil society. So thank you very much.